How y'all doing today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name is Brandon Robinson. I'm the community organizer and lobbyist for the Stop Torture I Ride Coalition. Um, we're here today to introduce our bill, the Reform Solitary Confinement Act. Our goal with this bill is not to end solitary confinement, but to reform solitary confinement. We understand that the correctional officers use solitary confinement as a way of holding individuals accountable, but they abuse it. And we want to make sure they're not abusing it, we want to make sure they're using it. I myself have spent eight months in high security and 90 days in solitary confinement, where you're locked inside a cell with cold air blowing on you 23 hours a day. And that's only because you're allowed out of your cell for one hour a day. On the weekends and on holidays, and when the Patriots are playing, it's 24 hours a day. I've been in there where I had to have all my clothes on and be underneath the covers and just let a little bit of air in so I can breathe and let a little light in so I can read the book that I was reading. And I've also talked to my neighbors who were suffering from sensory deprivation, which made them hallucinate and paranoid and unable to cope in regular population, never mind in society. I've had to wipe the blood off the walls and untie the knots from the individuals who couldn't take it anymore, who, who rather take their life than suffer these torturous conditions any longer. They took their lives and they didn't have to. We need to make it so individuals don't have to go through these conditions and we can do that by passing this bill. Individuals deserve to have a chance to be rehabilitated versus continuously punished. They're already being punished by being incarcerated. By them having, being, having a chance to get rehabilitated is not going to change their sentence. It's not going to stop them from being locked up. Even though they're incarcerated, they still have rights. And they should have those rights afforded to them because they're still human beings. People ask me, what is the response that I get when we go to places like Foster, North Smithfield, and Jamestown? What do I say to these folks? And I just let them know, just like I let anybody else know, that as long as you're in Rhode Island, and as long as just like anybody else who has family members who are part of the LGBTQ community, part of, who has mental health problems, who have drug addiction problems, they can end up in the ACI inside Cranston. And just like me, they can end up in solitary confinement, being tortured. It can happen to anybody. And instead of them being tortured, why don't we give them a chance to get rehabilitated? Why don't we give them a chance to participate in the reformation of solitary confinement? I'll say that, and then I'll pass it on to Charlene Liberty's sister, Alicia Liberty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alicia Liberty, and I'm here today. I'm here today to give you a small but significant glimpse into my sister Charlene Liberty's life. Before her passing, I watched Charlene's mental health decline due to the conditions and regulations of solitary confinement. She went from depression to severely suicidal. She was seeing faces on the walls and hearing voices that weren't there. She was suffering mental breakdowns. When she would cry, the correctional officers would shackle her, empty mace in her face to shut her up. You could only be a cruel person to inflict such treatments while listening to Charlene beg for you to stop and tell you that she would rather die than live in these conditions. Her words, I would rather die than be in this place another day. 
She meant it and she proved it. So, to escape this trauma, she climbed on top of a sink and dove to the ground head first in an attempt to break her own neck. This resulted in her being in a coma for a few days. When I went to the prison and asked the lieutenant what happened to her, she laughed. She said, who, Liberty? That wasn't even that serious. Charlene also rammed her head into, against cement walls. She swallowed razor blades that she had surgically removed. She did these things when no one was looking. She thought her only way out of this was to die. The things that she experienced was so horrific, she became the lead case in a class action lawsuit against the ACI with the ACLU. People with mental illness should not experience the type of trauma that solitary confinement causes. It exacerbates their illness and it causes irreversible harm, which leads to repeat offenders or worse. Like in my sister's case, it led to her demise. We understand that solitary confinement is a tool for correctional office to, to use to hold individuals accountable. Our goal is to ensure that they use it and not abuse it. Thank you. Uh, my name's Eddie Franco. 69 years old, and I have approximately 48 years locked up at the ACI here in Rhode Island, the prison system. I got about approximately 12 years in solitary confinement throughout the years. Uh, I was a jailhouse lawyer. I helped inmates throughout my stay in prison to fight the system. And what the state of Rhode Island people have failed to realize, when it comes to the Department of Corrections, there's a lack of transparency and a lack of awareness. Uh, from A to Z, to the health, uh, to the conditions of solitary confinement that are torturous. You have states, New York, they put limitations on solitary confinement. Now, Rhode Island, they continue to maintain the status quo, which they have throughout the past decades of torture. This bill says you only go to solitary confinement for an act of violence, not for taking a slice of bread out of the dining room, which occurs now. Not for being late for count, not for standing up for count, which is the case now. The reasons that you go to solitary confinement and you're locked in a cage for 23 hours a day would be amazing to society and the people in the state of Rhode Island if they knew, if they was aware of why these people are going to solitary confinement. Yes, they go back to violence, but they also go because their T-shirt's not tucked in. Let's call it what it is. There's lack of transparency. There's lack of awareness. And I'm hoping that this bill forces an oversight with the passage of it to break the carte blanche procedures that the Department of Corrections have over the state of Rhode Island. There has to be oversight. There has to be transparency. And there's not, and there hasn't been for the 48 years that I've been there. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. In the 1800s, the Russian philosopher Dostoevsky wrote that 
the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. A hundred years later, the French sociologist and social theorist Michel Foucault published Discipline and Punish, in which he outlined that despite all the improvements that human civilization has made over the last centuries, its style of discipline and punishment has remained largely unchanged and has both historically and contemporarily been largely ineffective. It's worth noting that both these men uttered and wrote these words decades before the American project in mass incarceration. We're not good at punishing people. We've never been. It's not a uniquely American problem, and it's not a uniquely modern problem. But one of the few things that has changed over the last several decades is a recognition that mass incarceration was wrong, didn't work, and at least somewhat of an expressed interest in trying to improve our systems of discipline and punishment. So the bills that we have before us today, while they have my name on it and Rep. Felix's name on it, they're really the product of years of work from the people who stand behind it. Folks who have lived this experience, folks who have worked and collaborated with other organizations to try to reform what happens within the walls of the correction system. And so the name of the bill itself is a sign not just to members in this House, but also to the Department of Correction, that we want to sit down to reform this, that we want to work together to reform this. We have all these folks here, folks who are watching at home, people who have written countless letters about how we can do this. A lot of what's in the bill is supposedly best practice from around the country and things that our department already does. And so to that we say, why not codify? I want to thank everybody for all their hard work in putting this together. The Coalition for working hard, thinking about things like names, thinking about things like tweaking pieces that make it work within the system, but that reform it so that ultimately it's a more humane system that speaks to the type of civilization that we want to be, the type of society that we want to live in for those folks who don't have the opportunity to step foot in our prisons. What I would say is that part of what this bill does is brings to light what's happening. Part of the reporting process is bringing to light what's happening behind those walls. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I hope that we can work together to get these bills passed. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Horton. I'm the co-executive director of Open Doors, which is one of the agencies that is part of the Stop Torture Coalition. The Stop Torture Coalition was formed three years ago with the primary goal of making sure that humans inside the ACI were no longer tortured, making sure that a high security prison was curtailed, making sure that long-term solitary confinement was ended, and that our state no longer relies on expanding incarceration as a solution to social problems. I want to talk for a moment a little bit about how we got to this point, starting years ago when I met Brandon Robinson uh, inside the ACI back in 2014. I was teaching inside the prison and Brandon was uh, doing work inside the education wing. He was someone who had shown such dedication and persistence towards his education that he was given the responsibility to help run or help support that area of the medium security prison. 
And because of the work he was doing, because of the work that we were doing, trying to help people, the Department of Corrections singled him out. And uh, he told a story in one of the meetings recently where he all of a sudden got a notice that he could no longer go to the education wing. He all of a sudden got a notice that he could no longer have some of the privileges that he had, including his own cell. These decisions were made purely in retaliation for the good work that he was doing. I think it's important to know because this bill isn't, note, note that because this bill isn't just about one aspect, one pro policy within the Department of Corrections, the use of solitary confinement. It's about the broader need for people to be treated as humans inside and for there to be limitations on the power and potential for abuse amongst correctional staff. There are many correctional staff who do an excellent job, who hold their, themselves and their work to high regard, but there is limitless ability to abuse that. And we see that in little ways, in the ways that Brandon was treated, in much larger and extreme ways, in the ways that Alicia Liberty was treated, sorry, that Charlene Liberty was treated. There have been a lot of statements made by the Department of Corrections over the past three years and by the Brotherhood of Correctional Officers over the past three years about what would happen if this bill passes. So I just want to make a couple things clear. This bill does not mean that the department could not respond, could not put someone in restrictive confinement if they act out in a violent way, in a dangerous way. It places no limitations on their response within the first 15 days after any incident. And after those first 15 days, all it does is require that someone get four hours out of cell time. Four hours instead of zero or one or two. That's the meat of the bill. That's the largest substance of the bill. And it's a small, uh, it's a small act of humanity to provide The bill also makes sure that individuals who are vulnerable, individuals with severe mental health issues, individuals who are pregnant, who are still very young juveniles inside the prison, would at no point uh, be um, punished with solitary confinement, i.e. they would always get four hours out of cell time. Um, that four hours out of cell time is what we feel is the minimum requirement for a human being. And it is also the minimum requirement that the United Nations has designated. It's the minimum requirement that multiple other states, including Connecticut and New York, who have recently passed legislation, require. Unfortunately, up to this point, the Department of Corrections has refused to even discuss this legislation with us. Last year, in the House Judiciary Committee, the sponsor, Representative Felix, said, is there any piece of this legislation, any single word even, that we could talk about? And the response was, we would uh, agree to no law that governs our actions. The Department of Corrections uh, to, to paraphrase the, the director. Um, the Department of Corrections for years now has been able to act without oversight and which, with what some would say impunity. And so this legislation also has uh, protocols that would allow people in prison to litigate, would, would create an oversight commission to make sure that the bill was properly implemented. Because it's absolutely necessary, as we've seen for many years, including since 2017, when there was a uh, study commission which recommended changes, but the Department of Corrections will not implement these changes unless they are required to. Um, there was one striking moment in the testimony last year when the Department of Corrections uh, 
clinical staff testified to the treatment that people were given, the assistance that they were given while they were in solitary confinement. After many people had talked about spending years in solitary confinement in which night after night they would try to sleep with the lights on. And Representative uh, Bella Wilkinson asked the department uh, staff, is this true? Are, are the lights left on all night? And the staff required or, or responded, I don't know, I go home at night. We're asking for a higher level of accountability than that. What we think is a minimum amount of oversight and accountability so that people are not tortured. Uh, we hope that this legislation will pass this year in its third session. Um, and thank you very much to the sponsors, Senator, Senator Acosta and Representative Felix, um, for their strong support. Um, and uh, are there any other statements that you'd like to make tonight? Like Nick said, I was afforded the opportunities to uh, work in the education building while inside. Um, I was afforded the opp many opportunities to get educated. I was able to get my associate degree. Upon my release, I was able to get my bachelor's degree and I'm now working on my master's. But let's not make me be the one off. Let's make sure that everyone has the opportunity to have these, um, these options. And what the bill will do with those four hours out of their cell would give them the opportunity to participate in rehabilitative courses and educational courses. Because in the long run, statistics say that an individual that's more educated and that took an opportunity to get rehabilitated is less likely to reoffend. And what that does is help reduce the recidivism rate. And we want to give that opportunity to every individual that's passing through that, those ACI walls. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, Representative Felix is on her way, but I know we all have things to do today. So um, do you have any questions, um, any questions or comments? I'm, I'm glad to answer them. Yes. What seems to be the primary objection is it coming from the unions at the ACI? Is it, is, is it the new ACI administrator? Has he responded to this? What, what seems to be the obstacle for what seems to be remarkably common sense legislation? Well, um, for the most part, we ask many times to sit down and have a meeting with the Department of Corrections. Um, a lot of times they would not sit down, they would refuse the buzz, they didn't want to make any adjustments. Um, we do feel like they feel threatened and that um, they look at locking people up in solitary confinement as job security. Um, I have written, um, sent emails to the uh, Richard Crowley and um, they have responded to uh, that they would sit down and meet with us. So hopefully there is a change coming and that we can sit down to start to reform solitary confinement. One, one quick follow-up. Do you think most folks in Rhode Island are aware that if in fact Rhode Island was actually a sovereign nation, that being in violation of the United Nations Human Rights Accords, the Mandela Rules, that we would be judged a torture state? Um, I, I really don't think a lot of people know this. Um, many times when we're out in the community and we're canvassing and we're talking to the people, we're knocking on doors, we're going into different communities, a lot of people are totally unaware. And, and I get it. Um, just like y'all, I go home at the end of the day and I want to, you know, take care of my family, make sure they're fed. Um, I close the door to the outside world. And, and if I didn't have personal experience with it, I may not be afforded that opportunity to know about it. But that's why the work that we're doing is so important. That's why we're out there raising awareness in the different communities. Because a lot of people would just turn a blind eye because they don't live in Cranston. They may not frequent Cranston. You know how Rhode Island is. We stay in our little city. We look at, if we live in Providence, we look at going to Pawtucket as far. Never mind going out to Jamestown or Foster or Newport or any other place. Never mind going to Cranston. Last, last quick question. When will the legislation potentially be heard and, and will be heard in House?
judiciary, or what, what do you anticipate the mechanics of the bill? So the bill, the bill has been um, introduced in the Senate. It's being introduced in the House, um, and right now what we have to do is we have to go before the judiciary committees in the House um, and in the Senate and testify in front of them and, and let our voice be heard. Uh, we, it's our jobs to wake up the, the, the judicial body um, and the legislators because some of them think that you know um, you don't get in you, you don't get in trouble for no reason. They think that uh, the, the police are not out there um, just locking up people in low-income communities, whether they have mental health problems, drug problems, or any other kind of problems. Um, what that results in is individuals getting locked up and ending up in solitary confinement for uh, petty, petty things like t-shirts not tucked, trying to t take a piece of bread because they don't have no food at night, trying to share if, if you're in high security and it's boiled egg day, and on boiled egg day we receive two eggs, and if you have two eggs and I have two eggs and, 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 and I have two eggs, and I want to give you one of my eggs, and, and I get caught giving you one of my eggs, we both get a disciplinary infractions, and we both get extended stay for 90 days. And this is how people in high security stay, end up in there for two and five years. And this is how they end up suffering from sensory deprivation. Well, I'm going to truly last question. Where can, folk, where can my viewers find out more about this? What was the question? What's your question? Uh, what, what, where can folks find out about it on the web? Um, you can find out more about the action in the, the work that we're doing on the Reform Solitary Confinement RI on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And it, uh, you can also go to our website as well. It's reformsolitaryri.com. Can I respond to his? Uh, yes. Thanks. I'd like to respond to your uh, question about the obstacles in the state of Rhode Island. It's the Brotherhood, the Union of Correctional Officers. They've had a strangled hold on every prison administration since the 70s. Rhode Island is the only state in the country where correctional officers can work four consecutive shifts. Every administration for the past decades, through arbitration, have tried to eliminate that provision. And the Brotherhood won't go for it. It's the only state in the country where you can work four shifts and you can make $200,000 a year as a correctional officer working overtime. So you want to, the answer to your question, where the obstacles are, the obstacles are the Correctional Officers Brotherhood Union, dealing with visitation, dealing with solitary confinement, dealing with lack of trades, dealing with $3 a day for the past 50 years, no increase for the cost of the living. Across the board, there's your obstacle, the Brotherhood Correctional Union. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, well, uh, thank you everyone for coming out. Um, I hope that everybody's able to come out and testify in front of these judiciary committees so we can get this bill passed. Um, let's reform solitary confinement.